Hi, I'm Kat Powers at the Somerville Media Center, and I'm here with our guest, Representative Mike Conley. Good afternoon, Kat. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So you have had a bonkers 2021 in the legislature. There's, we're currently in an environment now where kids are going to be possibly taking masks off at school. A lot of people are rolling back requirements. Uh, it, there's still a discussion about vaccine mandates. What's going on with the legislature with all of that? Well, you know, as you alluded to, it, it you know, COVID-19, unfortunately, uh, continued to dominate and, and, and interrupt um, our work in many ways. And it was also the focus of our work in many ways. Uh, normally, if we even back up a little bit more, normally a legislative session ends on July 31st of an even numbered year. But because COVID-19 uh, was such an emergency, um, we actually extended and continued our formal legislative session right up until, believe it or not, around 5 a.m. of the morning that the swearing in of the 2021-2022 legislative session was set to begin, um, which was completely unprecedented uh, as far as I know. Uh, and so um, after getting sworn in uh, last year, uh, the focus really shifted toward spending the federal money that was provided to us through the opera program. And that was a big focus last year, as well as redistricting. Uh, and of course, um, COVID is still with us. And so, you know, we're hopeful that um, this year will go a lot better than last year or the year before it. Uh, and so that's really a quick overview of where we're at at the moment. So you've had some successes when it comes to making sure this district has uh, some of their share of the COVID relief package. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, House 4219, an act relative to immediate COVID-19 recovery needs. You had some wins in there. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the highlights of this bill, um, and, and you know, to put this um, in context, the federal government delivered a total of $5.3 billion to Massachusetts as part of that American Rescue Plan. And thank you to Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and our federal partners for delivering these funds. Um, when that legislation reached us, you know, we were able to work on both general programs. And so we were able to, for example, put $624 million into housing programs here in Massachusetts. We were also able to work on local programs. So, for example, um, I filed a budget amendment uh, to deliver an additional $50,000 uh, to the Welcome Project in Somerville. That was so important because we know um, they've been on the front lines in helping to support uh, many folks in our community, including the immigrant community, um, help respond to the pandemic. Uh, another important local win, and, and Senator Jalen was the lead on this and we supported her, um, where we were able to deliver a significant chunk of funding to the Somerville Community Land Trust um, which will really help them uh, advance their mission this year um, and start to make that vision a reality. Let's uh, let's let's. Uh, so, what is the community? What is the community land trust? What does that do for us? Usually, when you hear land trust, you think you know acres with deer and whatnot. What does it mean in Somerville? So, you know, this is an effort led by folks locally in Somerville. I know people like Benue and Campin on the city council and others uh, have been uh, very focused on it. And essentially what it would do is allow um, the community in a nonprofit way to acquire property and then hold it in trust so that it can be developed for affordable housing in particular. And so essentially to, to really break it down, it's about taking land off of the, the private real estate market, holding it in public trust so that um, we can 
start to make more affordable housing more available to more people. And, you know, going into this year, the concept had really been agreed to, but funding uh, remained, you know, a need. And so it was wonderful um, to see uh, Senator Jalen pass an amendment on the Senate um, with the support of our entire delegation to ensure that some of this opera money would help them get going um, even faster. What else did the ARPA money do that, that is coming this way? Sure. So I think one of the things that it does that, that I'm most excited about is we dedicated $500 million toward providing um, what we're calling premium pay bonus checks for individuals who showed up to work, who, who couldn't do you know what I'm doing right now, which is sitting in my apartment working over a computer screen. Instead, what we wanted to do was create a bonus for people who had no choice but to show up on the front lines, uh, whether that um, is in the grocery store um, or in the classroom or in other venues. And so we, again, dedicated $500 million toward bonus checks. And just last week, uh, the governor finally announced the, uh, the parameters of how this is going to work. And so the, it will happen in multiple rounds, and round one um, will be delivered next month. And what that will consist of is $500 being delivered to 500,000 people in Massachusetts who um, were at 300% or less of the federal poverty level um, in their 2020 tax returns. But that doesn't include um, any benefits people receive, like unemployment benefits, wouldn't count against that. And if you're eligible to receive a payment, you will auto automatically be receiving a check uh, next month that will be mailed to you from the state. And again, that's just round one. The hope is that there will be a subsequent round of additional checks being mailed out. This is a little different from how the legislature originally planned this out, where instead of a check going to the folks at Market Basket or Target or wherever, there, there's, there's an income threshold. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And, you know, that's always an interesting topic. Um, and so the income threshold that was uh, arrived at is 300 percent of the federal poverty level um, I don't have that precise number in front of me, but I would guess that that, that brings you up close to $40,000 annually. Um, you know, so certainly anyone who's significantly under $40,000 annually, I believe, would qualify. And then again, the, the key piece being is people who are in person working. And so it's really for those frontline workers lower income workers, uh, not quite getting up to middle income. And of course, we know to sustain yourself in Somerville or Cambridge, you need, you know, quite a, quite a significant income. Um, but, but that is the nature of the program. And it certainly isn't everything I would want. But at the same time, I, I do recognize it as a big progressive win. You know, as progressives, one of the things we've really tried to normalize is this idea that if you want to help people, there's a large, significant chunk of people out there where the best way to help them is to hand them money, um, particularly in these cases where these are individuals who are working. And undoubtedly, at that level, you're not really getting ahead, especially in our community. So looking at this in a big picture, I, I really think it's significant that our state government has decided to do this kind of bonus check. And it's the kind of thing I'd like to see us do even more in the future. How would you do bonus checks in the future? Would, you, would it be an income threshold? Is it a particular sector of people who should be getting this money? How does that work? I think those are all good questions. You know, I mean, that would be, you know, a matter of debate. I think the, the underlying concept is that we live in a time of profound wealth and income inequality. You know, we, we live in a time where the rich, even during this pandemic, 
the, the very wealthy have continued to do better than ever, uh, and everybody else has struggled uh, to keep up. So I think the details could be up for discussion, but the larger concept is normalizing this idea that, that cash support is something that we should embrace, I think is a good thing, especially for our most vulnerable. Okay. So with the ARPA funding, there were some supports for childcare and housing as well? Indeed. So, um, you know, on the childcare front, we had initially received about $314 million um, from the federal government and we put that in something that we call the child care stabilization fund more recently uh back in december um the baker administration announced that uh this fund would be focused on something that we call commonwealth cares for children or c3 uh grants and these grants are to sustain child care and enable families to, to find care. Um, that will involve now, you know, I had mentioned initially it was 314 million. That pot of money is now um, been expanded to about 450 million in federal funds that we are now routing uh, between now and the middle of this year. Um, to really allow childcare providers to increase their salaries um, or expand ca capacity. And, and even though we're taking this step, we know in the grand scheme of things, it, it's still a drop in the bucket. So certainly I think the bottom line is we are making more assistance available both to the childcare providers to, to reinforce what they're doing uh, and uh, in programs to help families secure childcare. Um, and it was certainly, um, you know, I think a helpful thing, but, you know, long-term more has to be done. And, and just this week, uh, we've heard news that the state Senate is contemplating a more comprehensive, more permanent piece of legislation to address the needs of childcare. And I'm so glad to hear it. In Massachusetts, it still costs less to send a child to college than to put a child through child for, through daycare at this point. Or it, I don't. Perhaps it's if if daycare is the right answer, it, it, child care where so somebody can go to work to, you know, ring up groceries or stock shelves and and whatnot. These are still real issues in Massachusetts. Is there a next step to? Is there? An, what's the next frontier on the child care front? So, you know, these, um, these C3 grants, you know, are, um, are now sort of in process. So, you know, that would be the money that has been allocated um, is now being dispersed uh, through these state programs. Again, I think the Senate is contemplating a comprehensive thing. And then another, another aspect of all this that I should explain, uh, I mentioned earlier, we received approximately five, five point three billion in federal funding. Uh, we made the decision not to spend all of the ARPA money at once. Mm -hmm. um, that was an interesting decision. I, I, I might have been okay with spending it all at once, but I could also appreciate the wisdom that some um, promulgated to say, "Let's spend one tranche now. Let's get it out there, and then we can come back and spend the rest later." So we still have several billion dollars in ARPA funds, as well as uh, surplus rainy day funds yet to spend. And so, you know, as these initial programs, the child care grants, the bonus checks for frontline workers, as those get deployed, we will have uh, a second opportunity to do this all over again. And so my hope is we will do this all over again this year. Um, so that later this year into early next year, more supports and more additional relief continue to go out. And again, all of this is in the context of COVID. Mm -hmm. We also need to work on those more comprehensive, permanent solutions to make childcare affordable. It's such an issue. You know, many of my constituents explain, they say, hey, I have two mortgages, the mortgage I pay on my condo, and then the money to send the kids to childcare 
which is no less, and in many cases, a greater expense than housing. Um, and so it, it's really a crisis. And I know I'm dragging on and on here, but I will say, you know, part of the issue is these fundamental systemic problems in our society. We have a broken healthcare system. You know, we don't have Medicare for all. So because we failed to have universal, truly affordable health care, that then becomes a cost that gets baked in to the child care uh, cost. And so as health care goes up every year, that's just another factor that, that causes child care to go up every year. You know, we have an affordability problem when it comes to local retail and nonprofit space. And so because it's so hard to find affordable space, you know, that can become a cost that then escalates the childcare. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work on these problems directly and we have to work on all the contingent and side issues that contribute to make these problems so difficult. Okay, N no less tangled issue, housing. Housing, yeah. So, um, you know, um, the ARPA bill, this this bill that we, we passed last fall, in its own right, it does some wonderful things. It puts about $624 million into um, some key statewide housing programs, supporting home ownership assistance, um, building affordable uh, housing for, for sale, building affordable rental housing, um, it puts a significant chunk of money into what we could describe as supportive housing. So producing housing that will um, come complete with services for people who have chronically experienced homeless or survived domestic violence. Um, it also puts another significant chunk into modernizing uh, and upgrading public housing. Uh, which is such a need, and we know we've seen this need in Somerville as well. Um, and so that's a very significant investment. You know, our state does a housing bond bill uh, about every five years. And the most recent one, I was involved in it early in my time in the legislature. That is our sort of flagship fundamental investment in housing in our state. And that is typically on the order of about 1.8 billion over five years. So that's what we typically do statewide. And what I'm explaining here is we have done one half of the ARPA money, and that has given us 624 million toward housing. So if you think of it in those terms, it's as if this ARPA money is delivering to us multiple years of investment that we wouldn't have been able to make and adding that into what we're already doing. So that is good, um, but what's missing in this conversation are the actual substantive policy changes. You know, we're talking about spending money, which is part of one of the necessary pieces. We also need policy changes. And, and so I can talk a little bit about some of those. You know, we had a big hearing last month on legislation that I'm the lead sponsor of called the Tenant Protection Act. This would lift the statewide ban on rent control and make it possible for cities to bring everyone together to really discuss what would some common sense, basic rent stabilization provisions be. Um, so, you know, I'd like to see that move forward. It's still alive this session. Another big one, there, there's several big ones, two other big ones, and, and these are issues that the city of Somerville and our elected officials in Somerville on the city level have led on are the real estate transfer fee as well as the tenant opportunity to purchase. Um, last session, actually, I mentioned earlier how we had a very chaotic end to the session. It ended at 5 a.m. On, on one day. And then five hours later, we swore in the new session. Uh, at the end of that last session, we actually passed in the legislature tenant opportunity to purchase. And so some people call this TOPA. And what this is, is when a, uh, not all, always, but in certain circumstances, when an investor, owner, landlord 
sells their building, there's a small window of time where those tenants will be would be allowed to match the market rate offer that is driving that building sale. And so it's important to point that out. It isn't asking the owner of that property to accept anything less than what they would get on the private market. But what the legislation does do is say there has to be a brief window, it could be 30 days, where if there's a bona fide offer on the table, the tenants of the building have the opportunity to match that offer. And where this can become very powerful is when those tenants partner with a nonprofit organization in the city, uh, which is something that the legislation contemplates. Um, and, and that would enable them to sort of, you know, have a realistic shot of acquiring the building, having the nonprofit administer it and seek financing, and in this way, maintain more affordable housing in our community. So all of these things, rent stabilization, local transfer fees, tenant opportunity to purchase, um, in addition, we need right to counsel for people facing eviction. We need eviction ceiling. So, you know, it is currently the, the case where if you get an eviction, or even if an eviction is filed and you don't get evicted, simply the matter of that filing can stay in your record permanently, and future landlords could see that. Even if you didn't get evicted and you never did anything wrong, that one mark could carry with you permanently and other landlords may not want to rent to you. So those are some of the policy things that I'm hoping we can do in addition to getting more of this money out the door. So there's so much going on with ARPA. There's also a, a number of other issues that have been going on. So talk about, um, so uh, driver's licenses. We use driver's licenses, some of us, every day. It's you have it for employment, uh, to, to prove you're a resident for employment or to prove that you're a resident of Somerville to get the discounted rate at the Somerville Media Center, right? Driver's licenses, that kind of ID, that ability to drive uh, is fundamental to a number of us. How would you expand that right? So thank you for highlighting that. And so this is really incredible news, and I'm so glad we can share it today. Um, it has been announced late last week that the House of Representatives on Wednesday will take up this bill called the Work and Family Mobility Act. Um, and this was lead, lead sponsored by Representative Christine Barber um, and Rep. Tricia Farley Bouvier. Of course, Rep. Barber um, is one of our Somerville representatives, uh, along with myself and Rep. Eiderhoven. And so this is a huge deal, and this would make driver's licenses available uh, to undocumented immigrants in our Commonwealth. And, and this is long overdue. A number of other states have already done it. Um, and I'm so proud and grateful for Rep. Barber for getting us to this point because it has been an uphill battle. Governor Baker says he would veto the bill. And because of that, you know, we need to secure a two thirds majority in the House of Representatives to know that we can override his veto. Um, it's disappointing that the governor claims that he'll veto it because this is such common sense. We know that undocumented folks make up a significant and um, vital part of our workforce. They pay taxes in the Commonwealth and to deprive undocumented residents of the ability to use the roads, particularly in this time of COVID, you know, if you need to get to um, a COVID test or a vaccine appointment, it, it's really um, a matter of life and death and it's a matter of equity. So that is on the agenda for Wednesday. I gotta tell you, I think it might be the proudest and most significant vote um, I've ever cast is, is how I'm looking forward to it. And part of that has to do with the fact that, unfortunately, our legislature really has not done anything significant to support undocumented folks. I testified in support of this bill um, a few weeks back. And when I did, 
you know, I, I made the point that it truly is a shame that we endured four years of Donald Trump terrorizing and intimidating and antagonizing undocumented folks in the immigrant community in general. And yet we never took a significant step to support undocumented immigrants. So that is on top for this week. Um, hopefully it's still tenuous. You know, we, we, you know, I talked to Rep. Barber yesterday about it actually. Um, and she is counting the votes. She thinks she has the votes. But we also know there's that typical sort of right-wing backlash that um, tends to want to, uh, you know, be skeptical and in some cases be hateful toward undocumented folks. We know that's tied up in racism. And so I'm hoping that everything holds and we get this bill done this week. So there's a number of other things going on in the legislature. Anything top of mind these days? Um, I'd also add that we just a couple weeks ago passed what's called the Votes Act. Um, the Senate had taken it up in the fall. We in the House just passed it. This is legislation um, to expand voter access. Um, in the House, the bill that we passed uh, would make permanent all of the early voting and all of the mail-in voting that um, we've come to uh, expect during the pandemic. It also strengthens jail-based voting um, by requiring jails and prisons um, to really get uh, meaningful voter outreach happening. So to the extent people who are incarcerated are able to vote, that they can exercise that right. There was a, a big debate, one of the biggest debates I had ever been a part of uh, on Beacon Hill and that had to do with same-day voter registration. And just so everyone in Somerville knows, um, I'm a staunch supporter of same-day um, voter registration. Unfortunately, um, about half of my Democratic colleagues don't didn't support same-day registration. We had an amendment, and we had an extended debate on the amendment. And in the end, uh, 66 Democrats voted against same-day registration, 61 voted for it, and then all, most of all the Republicans joined with the Democrats. And so on a vote of 93 to 64, um, election day registration, which is slightly different than same day, um, was rejected. And so that was disappointing. The Senate bill included it in their bill. So as you know now, both bills go to a conference committee where the two branches will hash out those details. So it would be nice if that committee agrees to it or some, some form of it, but that was the sticking point, the same day registration. I hope we get there. Uh, nevertheless, it was still, you know, a, a very strong bill that makes permanent um, vote by mail and early voting. It also, the House version of this bill, this voting rights bill, it narrows the window, um, what they call the blackout period, from 20 days till 10 days. So under the House bill, you would have up until 10 days before Election Day to register to vote. Uh, that's an improvement, but again, I would love to see us get to same day. Several other states have same day. If they do it, I think we can do it. So we've got just a few seconds left. We're taping on Valentine's Day. What do you love about Somerville? You know, I love so many things about Somerville, but I would say, first and foremost, I consider Somerville to truly be the most progressive city um, in Massachusetts and, and really anywhere I know of. So I, I like the politics of Somerville. You know, I think we are... Um, very much leftist and, and intersectional and and progressive in our views and and i think on beacon hill what i say to folks is somerville is not the problem somerville is the answer and if more communities had our values and our commitment to community i think our state overall would be a lot better off Indeed, Somerville leads the way. All right, that's the time we have. I'm Kat Powers in the Somerville Media Center. Thank you, Representative Conley, for the conversation today. Thanks for having me. Happy to do it. All right.